Hello, everybody. Do you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, this is a really exciting moment for me. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy you're here, Christopher. Uh, this uh, is like, you know, a work in progress. We, we worked on it for a few months now to make sure that uh, Chris is here to talk with you all. Uh, the exhibit is now in the library in the sixth floor south. So if you haven't had a chance yet, go there. It's really awesome. Those are much better to look at when you see them in front of you than in the book. <laughs> but the book is also here. So if you're interested in the book, it's out there. Uh, we have uh, the books ready for you if you want to buy them. Uh, Chris may be generous to sign some of <laughs> the books you get if you'd like. Uh, and uh, so this program is, is supported and sponsored by the Friends of the Lia University Libraries. Uh, so this is a group that has been helping us uh, for 40 years or so to come up with those great exhibits and programs and speakers. Uh, and uh, thank you all for supporting us. If you're a friend, if you're not a friend, think about joining us because, you know, we, we'd love to have you around. Uh, uh, this particular program uh, was supported and kind of almost coordinated by uh, Kevin Nahoda. Uh, Kevin is sitting right there. He's a friend of the Lea Libraries. And thank you, Kevin, for uh, connecting with Christopher uh, and making sure that we have uh, insight into one of the best photographers I've seen or known. <laughs> and uh, I love, I love uh, Chris's work uh, and... We're going to know much more about it in the end of this almost an hour uh, talk uh, that Chris is giving us. And then we're going to have a panel discussion uh, together with Kevin and Florencia to kind of talk about the photography process and ideas and things like that. And some time for question and answers that you may have. Uh, the exhibit is going to be there till uh, middle of January or so. Uh, so in the meantime, you know, like you can continue to kind of explore the libraries and <laughs> come and see what, what we're up to. Um, yeah, so uh, without further ado, and thank you for waiting for us for a little bit. Here's Chris. Thank you. Let's see if this works. That's me. Um, there we go. Excellent, thank you all for coming. I'm sure you all know that it's it's kind of an honor to be here because Bethlehem Steel Bethlehem Steel Mill is nearby, and um, we were at lunch today at Mountaintop, and they had some prints up there of Bethlehem Steel, and I'm looking at them, and I hadn't seen one in particular, but Kevin says, "Oh, you you know this guy?" And I looked at one of the prints, and I was like, "That's in my bedroom," and. This guy, Joe Elliott, was my mentor. Uh, and he was photographing the mill back in the 90s when it was still operational. So most of those pictures I have embedded in my in my psyche. And it was really wonderful to see them there. So I texted him right away and, and let him know that this, these pictures were up. Um, so that said, I'll be talking a little bit about factories today and manufacturing. That's the cover of my book. Um, and I'd like to start out by saying that uh, over the years, I, I realized that now most people have never been inside a factory. Uh, decades of global outsourcing have decimated American communities and, uh, and these factories. And today we have no idea or how the shirt on our back is made. We do so much of our shopping online that we've lost touch with our analog roots, yet we still live in a physical world. And if you look hard enough, some of these things are made in America. And with the pandemic and global supply chain shortages, competition with China, national security issues, all kinds of things, it's created what I think is sort of like a perfect storm for comeback in American manufacturing, not all sectors, but quite a few. Um, and so I'd like to think that, that now at this time, um, American manufacturing is making a comeback. And that's kind of why I wrote my book. And so through the past decade with personal projects and editorial commissions, I've been on this journey to figure out 
to learn more about what was made, uh, what, what's made here. Um, not only the traditional industries that so-called built this country, but also uh, the newest and most technologically advanced processes. Some of the factories you'll see and that I've seen have pretty much stayed the same by shifting their, their clientele to a, a niche, niche clientele that wants the genuine article made on vintage equipment. Other factories and companies have um, sort of evolved over time, uh, reinvented themselves repeatedly as new, uh, new applications have come on the market for their products. And then there are the latest manufacturing trends, which are creating new manufacturing possibilities that didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, and all of these places I found that I've seen, and I've, I have been selective in what I've gone to, share this sense of commitment to pride and craftsmanship that can't be outsourced. And while the notion of making all our stuff here uh, is you know, naive and, and nostalgic, it's no longer uh, something that, that you think of it's, it's romantic, but it's now kind of a necessity as the pandemic proved. In um, 2010, I just finished my book, Asylum, which was about state hospitals, abandoned state hospitals. And I was looking for a new project. And my family at that time lived in Maine. My mom was always a great source for, for ideas. She would say, oh, you should check this place out. And she told me about this yarn mill in Maine. Um, I grew up in Boston and New England. And so I kind of knew about the textile industry. And I visited this place. And while the workshops that I'd seen in the state hospitals had long been abandoned, this place was completely still in use. I couldn't believe it. After conversations with employees, I learned about other mills in New England, in the Northeast, still sort of surviving. And uh, all of a sudden, I found myself driving around the Northeast, trying to find these remnants of this once dominant industry that had fueled the American Industrial Re Revolution. Of course, the key word is remnants because most of these places had moved south long ago and now overseas. And so the textile industry, the apparel industry, shoes, is pretty much vanished uh, from America. But you could still find remnants of it and certainly more factories in the south that make commodities, you know, the yarn or the fabric, but not so much the clothing. But there were still these remnants. And I befriended these mill owners who, in addition to opening their doors and saying, come up anytime, would often call me and say, you need to come up today. We have a colorful production run. This is in Massachusetts. This was uh, yarn that was actually uh, being made for those paint rollers that you'd buy like at Walmart, pink paint rollers. Um, they also made yarn that would go inside Major League Baseball. But the owner called me up one day and he said, Chris, you got to come up. We're running pink. We're finally running it. I already had this picture in orange. Pretty good. It wasn't pink. Um, and this is the third time I'm telling the story today. But I hesitated because my car was parked right outside my apartment. I live in New York City where there's alternate side parking. It was an incredible parking spot. And I really didn't want to give it up. But I did go up there that day and I made this picture. And even though I made many pictures at this mill, this is the one that keeps coming to the surface all these years. This mill is no longer um, in business. And these guys were frank about the difficulty of persevering in a economy that has turned its back on traditional manufacturing. There was one mill I visited in Fall River where they used to be, Fall River was like, every building was like some uh, apparel manufacturer. And the guys there, they're all uh, from sort of Portuguese descent, and they said, you could quit a job in the morning and get a job at another factory down, down the street. You know, this is in the 70s. And I found one place that still made shirts. And he said, Chris, I wanna show you something. You're gonna be able to get in one picture, you're gonna be able to capture the arc, the entire arc of the textile industry in one picture. And I said, I was getting really excited because I'm thinking, I'm gonna see a picture like this, but on this giant scale. When we walked down this, big building and you open this door and this is what we saw. And he looked at me and he said, gone to China. 
And it was just like, you know, it's one of those moments that's just like, there it is. Wasn't the picture that I wanted to see. Um, but I'm glad I made this picture anyway, because that's part of the story that I have to tell. Historical precedent figures prominently in my work. And so when he showed me that room, this is what I wanted to find, but without the, the child labor. This is Lewis Hine, who was a big photographer in the late 19th and early 20th century. He photographed everything, um, super important, but he, he photographed a lot of textile mills when, when they were really at their heyday. And so I actually saw you know, a lot of places like this that had survived um, that were op operating at you know, a fraction of what they used to be. And so this was what I was always looking for. And I realized that my project, um, given my architectural background, yes, it was an exploration. It was, it was a, a, an architectural study of machines and things like that. But it was also an attempt, an archaeological exercise to retrace a line all the way back to the 19th century to these earlier mills when they were at their, the height, the peak of the American Industrial Revolution. And I could actually, when I was talking to these mill workers, some of these people had worked in the same place for 50 years, as had their parents and grandparents before them. And so you're looking at them and you're seeing all the way back into the 19th century. And so that's what I was trying to capture. This was one picture that I almost got there um, in Rhode Island, another place that has since uh, uh, closed, you know, mostly because the owners just get tired of doing it. But this was like stepping back in time. It was completely frozen yet uh, still in operation, hadn't changed much in 50 or 75 years. But I realized that um, it was kind of a futile exercise because I was trying to recreate something that didn't exist anymore. Luckily, I found what I was looking for much closer at home with the Steinway Piano Factory in Queens. Uh, this is the original Steinway factory. There are actually two Steinway factories, one's in Germany, but the original one uh, or the fourth one in New York City is in Queens. And so it's still there and they still make pianos much as they have had, have been doing since the 19th century. I visited the factory in 2002 on a tour and I thought about it, but I didn't possess the skill set or the interest yet to, to, to make pictures. My family is a, is a musical family. And after my mom, after my father, and grandmother passed away. They were both musicians. This, the factory and what I'd seen take on a, took on a more profound spiritual importance. And I felt this obligation to return to this place that was so important to my family. So amazingly, I got access. Um, and this was the first picture that I made. I thought about it for nine years. And it's a view looking through piano rooms. After they bend them, they have to go into a conditioning room where they sit for like a few months or six weeks, I forget. And it's really dry and it's really warm and it's pitch black. And so you enter this room and it's like, you know, where am I? And then you kind of turn on maybe one little bulb and you see rows of pianos and it's just nuts. So I had to add the lighting, but this is actually the first picture that I, that I took. And amazingly, it's still probably my most popular picture um, to this day. The other thing that stuck in my mind was what's called the rim press. And this is how they have workers have about 20 minutes and they take these long strips of maple laminations and they gather them up. There's like four or five guys. They put glue on them and they have about 20 minutes to wrap them around this press. And after a few hours, they take these things out and you get that iconic shape of the piano. I was always deeply moved by this because this was the moment when concert grands are born. From this humble room in the basement at Steinway, these pianos will go to the greatest concert halls in the world. And it was so cool to watch these guys work. And yet, I couldn't get a good picture of it. I was shooting on film. And um, there's my camera there, a view camera, four by five. It just didn't, wasn't beautiful. It was interesting, but not photogenic. And so the end picture, you know, was just the detail of the press. And sometimes as a photographer, you kind of have to know, you have to be able to differentiate between what is interesting and what is photogenic. The factory is really charming, but it's also very cluttered in an old fashioned kind of homey way. Uh, very interesting to be there, evocative. You can smell the wood, you can smell the history, 
but most of the factory is not what I would call photogenic. But there are really quiet moments where these soundboards are, you find, you know, row of soundboards where you know what it is. And the great thing about pianos is we all know what they look like as a whole when they're finished. My photographs look in the opposite direction. I'm trying to deconstruct the whole and take something like a piano and break it down into its constituent parts and hone in on those, those moments of in the choreography of production that are essential and beautiful. Um, I've had a lot of success with some of these long-term projects in New York City, which itself used to be a huge manufacturing hub. Another place I got into with it was a, a General Pencil in Jersey City, another place my mom suggested. And it took five years to get in here because when I pitched the company uh, about doing a piece on them, I said, this is, well, I can see it now. The headline will say, last pencil factory in America. An owner does not want to hear that. And they said, we're not comfortable. In between those five years, I did a book on Steinway. They saw that and they said, that's what we want. What's ironic is that when the New York Times Magazine ran this, the features, the name of it was inside one of the last pencil factories in America. And their orders, you know, skyrocketed. So it was all good. But um, photographing pencils was a lot easier than pianos in a way because I could really hone in on what was essential. And it's a small scale. I could light it. I could treat these almost like architectural models. I could get above them. I could pull back. To me, they were like drawings where I was trying to convey useful information and also beauty. Um, and to me, this was sort of the, the moment when a pencil becomes finally becomes a pencil when they add the ferrules and the erasers. But it took me getting on top of it to kind of make sense of all the chaos. And color started to become a huge part of my work where uh, color is everything. I have this picture in many different colors, but I knew blue would make it, something about it would just make it special. And I also started to really hone in on the elegance of the workers. These are people who do the same thing every day and, and it's kind of like a dance. And so once I locked in my composition, I could let the action unfold organically and capture these people when their hand or their fingers looked just perfect, when the pastel was sort of gracefully laid across one of their fingers. Um, you know, it's my job to honor these people. These are pencils being sharpened another very mundane thing. And it's one of those aha moments like, oh, so that's how they do it. They drag these pencils across, they rotate them across a drum of, of sandpaper. And within a fraction of a second, they go from being a, having a blunt end to being perfectly sharpened. And I probably have a hundred versions of this, but there's only one where that shaving is right in the middle and it's just perfect. I typically shy away from what I call inventory shots, which show rows of things because they're kind of easy and they don't tell you much about how something is made. But as I, as I said to an editor, I said, well, that's low, fry, low, low hanging fruit. And she said, well, yes, but it's fruit nonetheless. Um, and these are the, actually the kind of pictures that resonate with people because they're just beautifully abstract and um, they're recognizable, but uh, you know, they're just, different enough from what you expect to make it captivating. So I do try to always include them. The most challenging place I ever photographed uh, was the New York Times printing plant in Queens. And it took almost as long to get in here. And I later found out that, you know, a lot of it has to do with like the marketing person or the public relations person. Do they want to be bothered with doing the paperwork to get you access. And so even though I had this relationship with the New York Times and the New York Times Magazine, the pretty plant is its own little world. And I don't know if the woman didn't like me or whatever, but I also found out that I, they didn't want to store physical prints because I said, you let me in, I'll give you a complete set of prints. And it's really sad that, you know, in this day and age, people just don't want to store stuff. I finally got in and uh, being in this place was just overwhelming. It was just, it's a vast, it's like the length of, you know, two football fields and they've got these giant presses, multiple stories. It, the sound is insane. 
the smell of the paper, there's nothing like it. And it's just like exciting. And yet you don't know how to, I didn't know how to approach it. And I would, I would walk by every time I go in there, I would walk through this hallway that was lined with pictures from the forties and fifties, the heyday of the printing press with the guys, with the, with the bell bottom, you know, the dungarees and the shirts like this and the little caps that they made out of the newspapers and the tattoos. And you could see all the stuff. And now you don't get that. And I would walk around the plant looking for, pick for the composition that I wanted and it would just elude me. And I, I would sometimes leave there just almost in tears thinking I was a failure. And I realized like, you're not gonna be able to replicate that. It doesn't exist anymore. Those lead plates, you know, the, the, the lead type, the, the hot type and the lead plates, it doesn't exist. Stop chasing it. What about this do you like? And I said, well, it's the fact that these machines are so large that you can inhabit them. And so once I locked into that, things started to happen. It wasn't about explaining how these things are made. It's about how does it feel to be there. And so um, I befriended these pressmen and they would, you know, pose for me in it. But it took a couple of years. And I think I went there like 35 times. Um, most of those visits, I didn't get anything. But when I made pictures like this of a maintenance of one of these presses, I knew I could hang a project around an image like this because it just showed these things in a different way. An, an object like a pencil that you take for granted and it's my job to show it in a, in a new and beautiful way. The most quintessential um, view that I thought of the printing press is the kind of one we always think of. You know, you always think of the old movies with the, the papers spinning around or you see the presses going like this. Well, that, that is really where it, it comes alive. That's where the giant web of paper gets coated with ink and all of a sudden it's a newspaper. The problem is, is that this changes every day. The width of the paper they use, how many cylinders they're running, which presses they're running, how the paper is configured through the, the press. It, you never can predict it. This book made it, this picture made it into the New York Times Magazine and I, we still like it a lot. And it's very abstract because it's a long exposure, but this thing is, this thing is spinning. They can print 100,000 papers an hour. So they would let me, I'd be up there climbing alone with my camera inches away from this thing. It was nuts that they would let me do this. Um, but I knew I could get better. And these guys always told me about what was called triple drama. And triple drama is a feature that they run once a year. And you gotta imagine over the years, the paper has been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Plus ads, it's just they don't, from the time when I started the project to the end, it shrank. And so what I saw in the beginning, which was amazing, was very hard to read to capture again. But they said, you gotta come back for triple drama. That is when we print on one day, in the fall, all of the Broadway shows take out full page ads. You gotta hit it. And so every week I would get the schedule, the printing schedule, and there it was one day, triple drama, one chance, get it right, about a couple hours, and then they're all done for the year. That's it. So I went back and I was able to, by this time I, I was like, all right, I'm gonna light this thing, I'm gonna do it right. Um, it's a different picture, but you're seeing glimpses of the shows that were on that year. And once this press ran, once it was done, it would never happen again. So one chance to get it right. And I'm glad I went back. That piece was really uh, well received. Um, and it had a wonderful uh, introduction or, or essay by Luke Sant, Lucy Sant now. And it was just, when I read that, it was, you know, I'm, I realize why I'm not a writer. Uh, because some people can kind of sum up what you're trying to say in words and they just do it effortlessly. But the New York Times sent me out four years ago to Phoenix, Arizona to, to do an essay on the printing of voting ballots for the 2020 election. So I go out there and, you know, it was a pandemic. I didn't have two years. I didn't have 30 visits. I less than two days at this place to come up with an essay. There was no precedent. It's like, you got to come up with, with a story a visual story, and then we're gonna put text to it. So I, I nothing to go on. Now, I don't know about you, but this does not seem in any way exciting to me. And I showed up there and I was like, are, are you kidding me? Like, this is what, this is where they print these, these ballots. 
There's no cool old machinery. Like, what's going on here? It looks like a warehouse. I took a step back and I said, all right, what is the essential process? What are those moments that say printing or that say ballot that I can't, that you couldn't find anywhere else? So I found one of these big Hewlett Packard printers in the back, which was not that interesting, but I knew at this time I was better with lighting and I knew I had to kind of focus on the beautiful. That's my typical setup with a softbox, and you see my camera there. And this was the end shot, which was the sort of the first picture in the essay. Um, I think it came out all right. And when it's paired with graphics and a good text, it really starts to come alive. I've been fortunate over the years uh, to work on great editorial commissions that are essentially extensions of my personal work. Sometimes I suggest things. They say, we want to do this feature on blah, 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 or we're doing the magazine. We'll have this theme. Do you have any ideas? Uh, this is for the kids section for the New York Times. And um, I said, well, let's do one on Martin guitars. Well, we want to do instruments. And so we zeroed it on Martin guitars. So I spent a few days there. And the great thing about print is that there are constraints right off the bat. For this, you have the broadsheet that they, they open up and you have to figure out the number of steps that are gonna go into this. We decided, I think on 21, that you're gonna shoot vertical. And you know what are, the, what are the important steps? And some people might think it's limiting, but when you walk into a factory with endless possibilities, this is a blessing because you, it gives you, lets you focus on what's important. And so this is, a lot of, this is a lot of fun. And the wonderful thing about manufacturing for photography is that there's a linear process. There's a start and there's a finish. And if you kind of know what you're interested in, um, it's just like, once you know your beginning and end, then it's a matter of going in and filling in all the blanks. But this is a lot of fun and we spent a few days there. And what's nice about a place like Martin, as you'll see in other places, is that it's a combination of old and new manufacturing. So they're using modern techniques where they can and traditional techniques for the parts that are musical. So they never, like with Steinway, they would never compromise the quality of the instrument. Another fun place, which you all might know of, is Peeps, which I think they make here. It's funny that they make Martin and Peeps very close to here, right? Um, Peeps have been on my radar for a while. And then the New York Times, the magazine, uh, the kids section wanted to do something for Easter. There it is. Having the magazine support helped with access. Um, but unlike a place like Martin Guitar, where I can talk to the person and say, hey, can you slow that down? Or, oh, that's really cool. Or could we stage this a certain way? They're not slowing anything down for me, for my, my little artsy fartsy photographs. Um, they're basically like, are you done yet? But the advantage of using lighting is that I can freeze what would normally be a very, very long line of production. It's not going to stop. And I can zoom right into those guys. And this is a proprietary process, the actual squirting and the making of this, like, you know, the, the, the little chicken. Uh, but it did, that's not interesting. What was interesting is seeing these things in, in the fact that when they're not coded. Here they are a little bit farther along. Uh, on this S curve. And what's funny is that when I showed up there, I'd, I'd watch my videos and, I, and I, had, I said, okay, we got limited time, but I watched my videos, I've done my homework, and this is, the, this is the picture I want. The huge row coming down, six rows of peeps, a sea of peeps. I get there, oh, that line's down today, or half of it's running. I was like, are you kidding me? When's it gonna come up? When are you gonna get it going again? Oh, a half hour, half hour goes by, hour goes by, Two hours goes by. Oh, it'll be up tomorrow morning. Sure of it. Down. And I'm thinking, we got to get the money shot. So we went on a, a tour. And you never leave any stone unturned. Upstairs, they had another smaller line, but it had that S-curve. That was it. Because something about that was, in a way, more magical than just seeing it straight. And so the great thing about using lighting now is that I was able to really focus focus in on what was important and freeze that action without slowing down the production, which would have really pissed them off. This is my current lighting setup. This is at the Utrecht Paint Factory, uh, more yellow, um, in Brooklyn. And 
I use soft boxes. I think I love about soft boxes is they create a soft light. You can't really tell where it's coming from. You obscure the background. You create a sense of darkness and intimacy and warmth. And you focus your attention on what's important, depending on the size of the soft box or how you kind of uh, um, flag it. And then I have my laptop. And so I can kind of lock in my composition lighting and then let the action unfold organically. So this is the final shot uh, for that. Um, can we see all right with the lights on? It's all right? Should we turn down the lights a little bit? Where is it? Oh, thanks, Kevin. That's up. Better? So, sorry about that. I realize, like, I know this works so well that I don't know, but then I'm thinking, geez, you don't, you've never seen it. Um, that's cool. Now you guys think I'm a, I'm, I'm probably better uh, than I am. But this is the final picture, and so I probably have a hundred versions of this. This guy got tired of doing this, going back and forth like this with his spatula. But I was looking for that peak moment of elegance when the paint was dripping and when his spatula was turned up, and when later on I realized what made this particular version so magical was the light hitting his eye. And I was sort of conscious of that when I was there, but that's a level of obsessiveness that you can't, there's no way to tell him to cock his face a certain way without making it look unnatural. And so you have to cast a wide net, but you have to have an idea of what you want, the final image of what you want in your head while you're doing this. This is from another project, More Yellow, um, that I did at the New York Times, at the, the MTA uh, repair shops in New York City, where they, the maintenance shops, where they repair and overhaul the subway cars. Another place that took years to get into, but once I was in, they kind of forgot I was there. Um, I love photographing people immersed in their work, doing something that is somewhat recognizable, but um, you know, in a, in a beautiful way. This is a, a roll sign from an older subway car. Anyone who lives in New York City will know exactly what this is. But I love the fact that it was graphic and you would know that it was a subway car without having to photograph the whole subway car. And as I said, historical precedent weighs heavily in my work. And someone who's been a huge influence is this guy named Alfred Palmer, who was a photographer in the 40s and 50s. He worked for the, I can't read my, uh, my notes, but he worked for the Farm Security Administration during the Depression. So he's one of these guys that they sent out a lot of, with a lot of other photographers to photograph America. And then during the war, he worked for, I think, the Office of War Information or something. But he went around to these factories, all kinds of factories, but in particular, aviation factories in California. And um, there he photographed young people at work during the war effort. And I love his pictures because his lighting was using strobes to bathe the person in this sense of warmth and intimacy while making them look heroic and taking out that background. What blew my mind is he's shooting on color transparency film, which is really, really hard to control. And he's using strobes. Nowadays, I have my laptop next to me. I can get it right where I want it, but back then, he just had to rely on his, on his skill and his intuition. But I love these pictures so much because even though they were made so long ago, you look at them and these people could be like from today, if not for the outfits. And this is also like a kind of manufacturing that doesn't exist anymore. I, know, I rarely will walk into a factory and see uh, people dressed that nicely or you know, working on stuff that shiny um, with that much metal and that much you know, color. And so I, I, I always have these pictures in my head when I'm working. I'm always thinking, like, if I could just re recreate that now, like with the Lewis Hine or that newspaper picture. And uh, so this is a picture that I made with that in mind of an electrical motor. And this is kind of like what, what I consider a, a cornerstone for my first chapter in my book, which is called, I think, Traditional Manufacturing. And it really has to deal with traditional manufacturing, but which is involves a lot of the human hand. Motors like this still have to be built the same way as they were 100 years ago. 
Um, and I love honoring the people who do this kind of work. If you look at her left hand, you might know what this is. You'll know the next picture, you'll get it. But I love my pictures to be have a sense of drama, convey useful information about how the leather's cut, and then also just be pleasing to look at. And I think I actually redid this picture. I bought a tighter version of this, and I showed it to the editor at Nat Geo, and she said, could, you, could we see more? And typically, you want to go tighter. And then I pulled back, and I realized, wow, she was completely right, because now you see that leather and the, really, the fact that it really is a, a cowhide. But when you're there, you see other things. When you're in the space, you always see it differently. Um, and it just good, it's good to show that it, it reinforces the fact that no matter how many times you do this, you still make the same uh, rookie mistakes. So these are the NFL footballs. Um, this is traditional manufacturing because the NFL does not want Wilson, which has been making footballs for the last, since 1941, to change their methods. They want these balls to be consistent in every way. They even have sensors in them, which can now track in pro balls and college balls, sensors that track the performance of the ball. You'd never see it. You wouldn't know it's there and it doesn't affect the performance, but these things are, are measurable now like everything else. Um, but it's, fun, it's really fun to photograph such iconic objects as this. Another fun thing that I photographed were the making of Oscars, the Oscars, which are cast in upstate New York and then they're plated in Brooklyn. Um, they're the perfect scale, they're easy to light, they're recognizable in every state, and, uh, and they're just mesmerizing to behold, especially when they're being plated because you realize that the Oscar is actually, there's a copper version of it, and then there is a nickel version. And I would have given anything to walk out of there with, with that nickel one. Um, I'll tell you, and holding these things is just like, you feel like a million bucks. I mean, it, it's, it's magical. And so see here, you can see all the steps and how they're made. And this is another process where you have traditional manufacturing with the latest technology. So on the left is a 3D uh, model that they've made, 3D printed model based on earlier Oscars of kind of like the typical Oscar, because if you go back to the 30s, all of these Oscars, they vary um, subtly. So there's the 3D printed model. There's the wax mold around which the mold will be cast and then the wax melts away. And then they pour bronze, which is the one in the middle inside. And that's kind of what it looks like when it gets taken out. And then they get sanded down and then plated. But you see from right, from left to right, how much smaller it gets as metal is taken away. The other place I visited, which is, uh, we made a print of this, which is one of those instances that like, when I was there, it was amazing, but I didn't know how it was gonna translate into a print. And I think it really, it really came alive. Uh, this is Stern Pinball in Chicago. And it's another wonderful melding of old and new traditional manufacturing, but there's a lot of uh, up-to-date electronics that now goes into these machines, but it's still the same visceral feel when you play pinball because that's why you want to play pinball. And this is for, that's Jurassic Park. That's what he was working on. The second part of my book deals with scale um, and also mass production. We live in an age when things are mass produced and we don't realize that almost everything we own, touch, come into contact with was made in a factory, was mass produced, where everything is the same. It's produced the same, it functions the same, it feels the same. It's the basis of our, of our whole modern way of life. And yet it's, it pervades everything around us. It's, it's so much a part of our lives that we don't even notice it anymore. And so this part of the book deals with that, with that sort of uh, you know, ability to make one thing endlessly, repeatedly, and have it be the same. These are golf balls. So golf balls, they have to look, feel, and work you know, just like a football, it has to be completely, they have to work completely the same. This was at uh, Titleist. Um, and so the second part of the book deals with scale and mass production, not necessarily big things. It starts out small with golf balls. 
And then it also deals with the traditional industries that built this country, like John Deere and Whirlpool. Um, and I wanted to honor these, these factories because a lot of these companies have stayed in their communities. And these are the kinds of products that don't get much attention, much love, because they pretty much look and stay the same over you know, many, many years. They just get upgraded incrementally in ways that you don't notice. But these were some of the most overwhelming factories you can imagine. It's like Willy Wonka of just washing machines and parts and flying overhead. And it's like, where do you go? Where do you, how do you, what picture do you take? It's just overwhelming. And so I always try to hone in on those quiet moments in the chaos and find order in the chaos. Something simple that is knowable, but not yet finished. And so this is sort of that sweet spot where we kind of know it's a dryer, a drum for a dryer, but it's not yet finished. This is John Deere out in Iowa, and this is you know an enormous factory. Most of us know their tractors, the, the iconic green and yellow, which is pretty much on every farm. They also make construction equipment. Um, overwhelming place. I mean, you can see here, it's just, it's just, it's too much to look at. But I did find moments where there was kind of playfulness, where you see the tractor, this giant tractor, looking like a toy where they're testing it. And so all those other pictures I make about the process, how they're making it, they kind of fall by the wayside and people keep coming back to this picture because it's just maybe inspires their imagination a little more and it's unexpected. This is uh, Spirit Aero Systems in Kansas. Um, a while back, I did a feature on Airbus showing how the A321 was made from start to finish. And when I was there, I didn't get the kind of access I wanted and I was frustrated with the pictures. So I went to Boeing for the book. I realized that Boeing doesn't really make their planes. They subcontract out everything. Uh, and they do final assembly at Boeing, but the fuselages are made in Kansas. And this was one of those rare instances where I actually went out there and it was as good as I expected, um, where you're seeing the plane in a new way, and yet you know it's a plane, but it's not finished. Here's uh, something that harkens back to those Alfred Palmer pictures. The person at work in aviation, this is a cockpit to a 767 turned upside. And one of these Alfred Palmer pictures I keep in my head for reference, here they're working on a, uh, you know, an engine for a propeller during World War II. And so it's impossible to recreate that now we have to do it. Now I can do it with a jet engine at GE. So all these projects, you know, I photograph one place and then that leads to another place, you know, and you realize that no factory exists in its own ecosystem. There's other suppliers. Uh, a company might have many factories that you can go visit. It's never just one place. It always, it's this ever evolving journey. And then I wasn't satisfied just to photograph that one little part of the jet engine. I had to go see the biggest engine that GE makes out in Ohio where they test them. And um, what's wonderful to see in some of these factories are young people working there where they're trained on the, on, on the job. And you realize it's, you know, modern factories, a lot of them now are not, you know, these old depressing places. They're actually uh, places where young people can, can learn a, a great vocational skill and do very precise uh, in-demand work all these, a lot of these higher end places, they can't find enough workers. At the tail end of scale are these shipyards that I photographed. And this is, um, uh, you know, it's always cool to see big stuff, but the challenging thing is that it's too big to move. And I feel more like a bystander, a documentarian, making a nice picture because my timing was good that day, but I'm not really exerting any kind of creative control. This is out in San Diego at General Dynamics. And from there, I was sort of playing the long game because what I really wanted to get into was the General Dynamics factory electric boat that makes nuclear submarines in Connecticut. So once I got into San Diego, I leveraged that, that article that came out that was positive. 
and got into the one in Connecticut. Here, I had people watching over me all the time, reviewing my photos. Uh, about 95% of what I saw, I could not photograph. Amazing stuff. Very frustrating. Um, the exact opposite of the pencil factory in every way. And yet, I was still able to find a detail that I think captured the kind of craftsmanship that exists at, at, for these submarines, where this is a hatch, you know, and it's not anything that's of military importance, so they let me photograph it. Uh, but it's built like a Swiss watch, and it's all built, you know, kind of on site from scratch. And you realize that manufacturing at all scales, a lot of it happens by hand. These ships, these giant ships are made up of sections, which are in turn made up of smaller sections. And all these things, a lot of them are made by hand, welded by hand, cut by hand. Um, it's not as automated as you would think. The last section of my book is called Factories for the Future. And this is a bit of a moving target because I'm dealing with uh, new technologies that have to do with sustainability, um, things that are on the cutting edge. And these are factories that will change very quickly over time. And so a lot of the things I photographed that appear in the last section of my book are already you know, outdated, but um, they're new enough. So this is a giant 3D metal printer in uh, California for a, a rocket engine. And so what they've done is they've taken the time it, it, it is required to build a rocket engine, you know, which would take, I don't know, several years, and they've condensed it into a few months. A lot of the technologies that you read about, like carbon capture, are infused into traditional products in ways that you can't even see or would be aware of. And so this is carbon dioxide that's been captured and put into the backing of carpets in Georgia for, for interface. Um, and having photographed textile mills and having been familiar with all these Lewis Hine photographs, when I kind of saw this and I saw him with the blue shirt, I think I actually told him to wear, change his shirt. But I knew what I wanted right away when I saw it. And I remember being very depressed after I made this picture. Um, it was for the New York Times again. And I knew that, you know, I, I mess up a lot and I, I hone up to all my mistakes, but this time I knew I nailed it. And I was depressed because I said, everything else we get for the shoot is just, it's just icing on icing, it's just filler. Um, because rarely do everything, does everything align in such a perfect way, that, a pleasing way, at least for me. And sure enough, this was like the lead, the lead shot in the article. Car factories are just like so overwhelming. They're so big. You have no idea how big these are, places are. You can't see end to end. You have to get in a golf cart. And as soon as you start going in this golf cart, you're completely disoriented. Everywhere you look is an amazing picture. Um, and this is at Rivian in Illinois, where they make uh, electric vehicles. And this is one of those cases where it's good to have someone who works for the company who is also a photographer showing you around. Because he said to me on the last day, he says, you should come see this. There's a, there's a picture I think you're going to like that I think will work for you. That was it. Um, a hood of one of their, their cars. I don't know what it does. It's in my book, the caption. So it's in there. But I didn't care what it did. All I knew is that it was beautiful. And it's, it spoke about, it said car, and it also sort of conveyed craftsmanship and precision. Um, and it made them look good. This is an electric bus being made out in California. Um, really more so than most of my pictures, but really hones in on my architectural, architectural sensibilities, where I'm going through a vast chaotic environment trying to find moments of order and clarity and i see a bus like that and that looks like a building and to me this is just architectural photography and i'm inserting people in there they're actually doing real work um, but it's a stage set upon which i can let the action unfold green energy is huge um, wind energy. This is a, in North Dakota. The challenge with photographing something like this is those blades are 200 to 300 feet long. There's no way to convey that without getting a lot of distracting context. 
But if you view the blade in section, like an architect would think, then it becomes something else and very ordered and pleasing. And here they are sanding down the fiberglass. So the other blade, there's another one that gets put on top. But it was interesting to see it. You know, you kind of know what it is. You don't need to see it finished yet. Um, these, this is a, a wafer, a silicon wafer with microchips. Um, the challenge with photographing new technologies is that you don't know what you're looking at. And a lot of what you're looking at is happening inside, in this case, machines that cost, and I'm not joking, $280 million a piece. They're the most sophisticated, expensive machines on earth. Um, and you can't open them up. They can't even open them up. Only the company that makes them can open them up. And so how do you, how do you get excited about something you can't see that you can't understand? And so whenever I can, I will try to include a person in the picture to kind of bridge that, that gap, to make it a little more accessible and intimate. Um, and luckily at this company, we were able to slow things down and stage it and light it to make these kinds of pictures. But uh, you know, as with anything, the quality of the work always depends on the access I get and the, uh, the relationship I have with the people and how excited they are to have me there. And if they want me to be there and they get excited about the pictures, then they're willing to stop things and stage things for me to allow me to make nice work. If not, then it's just a waste of time. This is a picture I just made last month. Robots are like huge uh, right now. They're not coming for our jobs just yet. This is Boston Dynamics and Waltham Mass, and this is the, these are the Atlas robots. The crazy thing is if you go to the videos, if you watch videos of these robotics companies, you think that they have a whole army of these robots. They only had four of these. It's just that the face of their public relations is, is, much, more, is much bigger than what's actually there. The factory is unbelievable. I mean, these guys are on the cusp of doing incredible work, but Robotics are yet to be made at scale, you know, like on the level of like peeps. It's just not there yet. These things weigh about 200 pounds. They are um, hydraulically operated. And the challenge with hydraulics is that it le they leak. And so these robots had been um, retired and they were hanging there like carcasses. So it was really cool to see them all three up front. Uh, I've also photographed glass. This is a cover for Nat, for Nat Geo. And the challenge with glass is that it's clear. It doesn't look like anything. Um, but I made this picture of bendable glass. So if you, have a, if you have an iPhone or a Samsung phone, that glass was invented and it's made by Corning. So I've had a lot of fun uh, doing glass, but it is the most challenging actual object I photographed because when it's doing its job, it's tra transparent. And four years ago, um, I was approached Corning because I wanted to photograph one of their fiber optics factories. Corning invented fiber optics, and fiber optics is the basis of the internet. It's the basis of like our modern way of life. Without fiber optic cables, we, we wouldn't be able to communicate. And not many people actually realize how important fiber optics are. Corning invented that in 1971. 1920, I'm thinking, oh, 50th anniversary next year. Corning's like, yeah, let's do this. Let's collaborate on this story. Pitching it to all these different places. Pandemic comes. No one's interested. It's 50 years old. Who cares? At the end of the email, I said, oh, and by the way, Corning's also come up with this new glass that's going to be used for the vaccine vials that doesn't break or delaminate. No one was interested, but one editor was at the New Yorker. And so I got a portfolio out of it. And it was really incredible to go up to uh, one of their pilot facilities up in Corning where they were making these things for the vaccines before they'd actually had distributed them to actually see you know, what was gonna save lives. Um, but very frustrating. And I never photographed something this close you know, where you couldn't, I wasn't gonna show up and say, can we slow down production? Oh, can you stop that for a second? No way. So, but luckily we got, we made some, some nice pictures. This is one of my favorite pictures. Um, and 
it's that beautiful combination. It's that sweet spot that I like where you see something that's marvelous and scientific and wondrous and you don't know what it is and it looks kind of high tech, but it's actually glass. It's actually this ancient material that has been continues to be pushing the envelope. You know, there are a lot of other technologies that you read about, robotics, AI, um, you know, green energy, quantum computing, all those things, yes, they're new, but they're always increments of other technologies that have come before. Glass is a part of that. It's this ancient material that is continually being pushed to the edge. And so this is another picture from Corning um, that I made. And, uh, She's cutting these things up to make sections that'll be sent out to customers and then they'll cut them up. It's like a pie and then they'll be cut up to use for all kinds of scientific things. But I love this because she's sort of, you know, at work focused and it, it harks back, harkens back to those Alfred Palmer pictures. And it really shows that, like I said, that most manufacturing happens at human scale within an arm's reach. And that even in cutting edge places, you will still find people. Um, it's a lot easier to retrain someone and they're more flexible into getting into hard to manage places than, you know, than it is to, at this time, to, to bring in robots or to, or to make, it, make it automated. And so I love this, pictures like this that seem both old and new at the same time. My last picture is of the, um, the American flag. This is a, was a very moving shoot. This is down in Virginia and Annan has made flags uh, since the Civil War. They, the flag, the Iowa Jima flag, is, was made at Annan in Virginia. Um, they made the flag that went to the moon. And it was really moving to see the uh, American flag being made because you knew right away what it was. You didn't have to see it finished. Um, and it occurred to me that it's, it's, a, it's a whole greater than the sum of its parts, much like I think uh, factories are. Um, and you know, in a factory, it's the place where democracy still works, where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Everyone has to work towards a collective, a collective goal. And so more than anything, um, I mean, my photos are about craftsmanship and, you know, precision and sort of mechanical skill and all those things. But more, more than anything else, they are about the people and the sense of community. And you have people who have soiled hands or in gloves or, you know, dirty. And next to people, people in, in, in the, the, the green, the, the white bunny suits, you have skilled, unskilled, you have old and young, and you have immigrants working side by side with, with um, native born American men and women. Um, and together, to me, I always felt that they give us, in this, this time of um, social you know, tension and, and chaos, they give us a sense of hope. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. So I think we're gonna have the panelists now joining us on next to the table and there's a way to do this. <laughs> cool. Should I am I should I sit or am yeah. I, or should I stand? You can sit. Is that, yes. Right there? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you go ahead. Sorry. I think we have an order, that's why I'm yeah. kind of waiting. Do I need to sure. Thanks. Oh. Okay. John, thanks, man. You go with me? That's really fun. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll be in the end. So uh, that was amazing, and thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now we're going to have a look. We have some time for a panel discussion about what we just saw. Uh, and, uh, you know, like maybe just introduce yourselves, because it's going to take me even longer <laughs> to introduce yourselves instead of like, you know, the, the time. But, uh, Florencia, do you want to go first? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Chris. Hi. Uh, I'm Florencia. I'm an assistant professor of art history, and I also teach the history of photography here at Lehigh. Okay. Uh, my name is Kevin Lahoda. I'm a uh, graphic design uh, assistant professor. I work up on Mountaintop here at Lehigh. I've been here for, uh, this is my third semester now. Um, it's, it's an honor to have Chris here. I've known Chris for uh, quite a while. Um, I think I met you, Chris, when... 
you were transitioning into this project from your asylum project. I think around that time. Yeah. So so it's really been kind of fun to to witness this evolution as Chris is moving through this work and sort of be on uh, be on the sort of periphery of of. of of that sort of experience and in the ways that you know when whenever we touch in and hear about where you happen to be off to next it's just really really fun stuff yeah and i'm buzz i'm the university librarian here in lehigh <laughs> so uh it, maybe i'll start just by kind of question uh like the communities right you're talking about community building and like you know like people that are going to the same place, have the same drive maybe, and like work on something together. And this is such an appealing kind of construct. Uh, definitely, you know, working in the library, I kind of, you know, like I think us working in a university, you kind of imagine at least that there is a lot of kind of, you know, drive to kind of do the right thing together to kind of make sure that, you know, they, we, we meet a certain expectation around uh, ethical, education and things like that. And you're touching all the time, you know, around the people working in those uh, those places and you, you're such, you're so good at documenting them. Uh, but also, you know, like you're kind of a historian of those facilities and like, you know, coming to us, you're talking about all the facilities that you are, you've been traveling in. And I'm kind of wondering about the, 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 the sort of art architecture of those workers, you know, what what's what are the facilities now? Because you were talking about, you know, like there's less of those humans that are experts in what they're doing, uh, and maybe it's kind of hard to get, you know, the people that are young and interested and driven to to do that type of manual work. Can you talk a little bit about the rest? What's what else is happening <laughs> in those uh, f uh, facilities, and how do you think, you know, our people treated in a way that, you know, kind of bring them along and they're part of the mission and, you know, they want to jump in and still feel part of that kind of community. Yeah. Um, my factories, the place I go, they're, 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 they're handpicked because they make something that I think is beautiful and, or useful. And the places I go to are generally, they're very, they're decent places to work in. They're not kind of the factories of old. Um, but I'll start by saying a lot of places are not, it's not romantic, it's not fun work. Like I, I leave there and I'm thinking like, I don't know how anyone can do the same thing. I mean, some of the, some of these things, operations are just like the same thing over and over and over. I would go crazy after five minutes. Um, so the conditions might be fine, right? Uh, they all kind of feel after, I've been to so many that they all kind of feel the same after a while. You know, I know where the bathrooms are. I know what the cafeterias look like. I, I, you see the same kinds of people. Um, but there's an energy there that is kind of infectious, you know? And for me, working at home alone most of the time, not interacting with people other than, you know, my family, and to go into a place where there's like, where they're making something, it's, it's really, it's very energizing, even if what you're looking at is repetitive. To them, they're like, a lot of people have no idea why you'd be intrigued. But occasionally you will get someone who's been there a long time and they're into it. Uh, like a lot of the, the higher end stuff, um, some of the, the aerospace places have the buzz of a tech startup. Mm. They feel like, uh, like Rivian, for instance, in Illinois, it's out in the middle of Illinois, in a college town, the cafeteria has farm to table food. And so it really is, it's about, a lot of it is about who owns the factory, who runs it. Um, and that kind of permeates down and like Rivian has a great culture there because the boss, the founder is actually will walk the floor and interact. Like, he knows exactly, he could like fill in and do that work himself and he loves it. Um, and so that permeates the whole culture and some of these smaller tech startups, some of the aerospace or computers, or you're getting people who are very educated, uh, or sometimes they're not. And they get trained on the job and they're so excited, like at the at the microchip foundry uh, in upstate New York, you know, you don't go to school to learn how to make microchips. There's only one way to learn. You have to learn on the job and they're happy to train you. And so there's this feeling of pride with a lot of young people that they're getting entrusted with insane amount of responsibility that you wouldn't get at a typical office job. Um, 
But then, you know, on the other side is like a place like Peeps where the manufacturing is not that technical. It's not that complicated. And so it is very repetitive. And maybe the people there, doesn't matter how well they're treated, it's, it is repetitive work. And so it's hard to get kind of excited about that. Okay. But I didn't see any one place where I was like, oh man, it's just, <laughs> these people are really being uh, mistreated. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I haven't been to every place. You know, I do, I am selective. And of course, if I get access to a place, no factory is going to let me in where the conditions are questionable. Like they know that if I go in there, they're opening themselves up. And even, but even if they weren't, uh, there's something kind of that ethical component in the images, but also in the way in which you talk about the images. Um, so my, you, you mentioned at the end, my work is about, you know, uh, manufacturing, my work is about, um, you know, all these techniques, but it's also about the people and it's precisely about the people. And um, there is um, um, a visual theorist, her name is Ariela Azulay, who talks about the political space of photography. So one part is the photographer, you, the other one is the subject matter or the person. And then the third part is us, you know, sure. viewers, like spectators. Mm -hmm. And then, so it's impossible not to think, for instance, in images of Sebastián Salgado, who kind of is very well known for abusing the pain of others, or Susan Sontag, and how kind of she blames those photographs in which um, there is a kind of marketization of suffering. And then in your photographs, what I found very interesting is that people is never kind of um, absent from the image, but there is a very kind of kind and ethical presence, like beyond, you know, the conditions of production. Mm -hmm. And I think that, so seeing kind of in retrospective, because they're, they're, they vary a lot, like there's a lot of different kind of projects. And it was also interesting to see that you know, sometimes you kind of mix your own work with the commission. And that was a question that I wanted to ask you because sometimes like the commission informs your work and sometimes your own work, your own interest informs the commission as well. Um, but it seems to me, you know, in a period, like in a time in which everything is so tense, I mean, the world is very tense. It had always been tense. Perhaps we, you know, we think it's more tense because there's so many images. Um, but that kind of interest in in um in the dignity right uh of those who are dignified through illumination through that kind of time of waiting and through you also name their names in some occasions you uh, say the name of one woman and yeah. like saying their names is something that sometimes photography kind of forgets about glosses over yeah. yeah and i think that in that moment like is when the space of spectatorship also becomes kind of a political space as well. Mm -hmm. um, so oh, very related to you know your comment on on the people. Yeah, if if I could just extend on that a little bit, that's something I noticed as you were presenting this trajectory going from your earlier work with the asylum series, where there's really no people; it's the remnants of people. It's like the sort of stuff that's left behind in this almost archaeological sort of fashion. And then easing into this project, and then easing into the subject matter and how you treat the subject matter, the, the human side of mm -hmm. manufacturing, not just not just the machinery, not just what's happening behind the scenes, um, you know, which is fascinating. But then there's that human component. Um, and I'm curious to know, you know, like as you're sort of moving through this project in the sort of great, greater sense of it, um, how that experience has played out for you and how you interact with the human side of it. Um, and touching on what Fl Florencia was saying, um, the sort of, you know, really sort of, you mentioned honoring the sort of the, the, the factory workers um, from the sort of idea of this nostalgic sort of past for American manufacturing, and then easing into this reality behind the scenes today, which you're depicting. Um, it's really fascinating stuff. But I wonder, you know, like that sort of really sort of responsible, sensitive sort of approach to the the, the, the individuals that you're photo, uh, um, photographing, like, is there, was there a, like a growth that happened through that process for you? Or was it just kind of like, you just kind of intuited a, a way where you wanted to be in relation to the, 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 the people you were depicting? Right. Um, yeah, because I, I eased into it a bit. When I was shooting film, 
it was very hard to make a good portrait because it's just if they move or whatever if they blink or yeah you, know, you don't know it until you get home and you develop the film um but i think i made enough good pictures to think oh this is worth pursuing these people some of these people have been here for so long that's what i gravitated to it's like well what's a record of, of someone spending their whole life in a place um and then other times I'd make a great portrait and the guy was just a temporary worker. It's like, mm. well, how do I deal with that? Uh, because that's not really, you know, it's a beautiful picture, but it's not really, he's not connected. So it's like, you're trying to balance honoring these people, but also photograph people who are photogenic. Um, and with digital, I think it's, it's my, the way I work now, it's a little better because I have, I can take as many pictures as I want. But I always try to find people who are doing something that's specific to that place. Because you walk into any of these factories and there's just like hundreds, sometimes thousands of people. So how do you find those perfect subjects? And usually it's someone who's doing, who's not only got kind of a great look and you kind of know what is gonna work, but they're doing something that's really interesting and really specific and they're really good at it. And so when they, they, when they work, I want to find it's always it's not only honoring them with the picture, but it's showing them graceful, like they're dancers. You know, I love it when it looks just beautiful. I'll photograph someone like they will hate me, but I remember I shot this one guy. He looked like Santa Claus, and he was taking this big bolt of yarn off this carter, giant big white thing, and his beard was like this. And I photo I was photographing him all day, and it just wasn't working. And I realized all I had to do. He was like this, right? He had this big thing. And I said, oh, shit. Mm -hmm, Switch mm -hmm. your legs. And it just, all of a sudden, he became just like, it was like elegant. It was just, so I think by infusing people with grace, physical grace, I can lend them kind of, I can, I elevate them. Not only, you know, with the composition and the lighting, but it's that gracefulness that, I, that I'm after that I think, is kind of transcends time and even what they're doing, even though what I want to capture is like a very specific, yeah. specific action. And definitely uh, Louis Hine, which uh, we have a lot of photos uh, of Louis Hine here in the collection at right. Lehigh, which is, I mean, Lehigh has an amazing collection of photography. Um, but I was also thinking that um, you talk about um, early in the lecture that when you're photographing someone, then you're also photographing their past because their parents, their grandparents, like, so, that photograph is a photograph of the past, and but also of the future in a way, because at the end you, finish, you, you ended up saying that no robots, they cannot really replace, right? Replace what humans do. So in a way, the photograph is kind of a memorial of kind of the the intimate past, right? The but also of the fact that humans are still there and this is still necessary. So there's kind of a temporal dimension. Not only like with people, but also with uh, techniques in those images that you made of the New York Times factory, which I found fascinating. Like the fact that photography was first um, circulated in the forms of lithographs, mm -hmm. right? Like through mm -hmm. paper, like it, because yeah. it, it was not possible yet to, you know, circulate photographs. Yeah. And then we're photographing, you know, you're photographing, you know, the production of paper again, which is something that seems to be from the past. So there's kind of this tautological dialogue between past, present and future, which is very photographic. Yeah. There's yeah. always that that I forgot to mention. Um, the the kind of sad thing about the printing plant. I mean, it's this amazing building. If you drive through on through Queens on six seventy eight, you see it, and it says New York Times, and it's got the window, and yeah. it's not an old building. It was designed by a famous architect, and I remember vaguely remember when it came out, and it was just like the showcase. Uh, but it is a process that is perfected. They have perfected how to print something. 100,000 times in an hour. And these machines are several stories tall. And they don't look old. Like you go in there and it, it looks kind of modern. And yet that company's out, like they're out of business. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you you feel like you're kind of photographing like what's happening now, but you're not really, you're, you're documenting the past. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's something that, that is, it's I struggle. It's, it's really hard to do this kind of work because you're meeting people who are going to retire. Mm. You're going to places that are going to be demolished, that are going to change. The owners are going to die or they're going to sell the property and it's going to get torn down. And so it's there's a documentation aspect of it, but it's sort of, 
it's like, I think every photographer feels that obsession about like preserving something, you know, and you could call it nostalgia or whatever. I'm not trying to be romantic about the old days, but you don't want it to go away because in a sense, it's, it's your own mortality. Um, and when I look at these people, yes, you're looking, you're looking into the past, their, their families and stuff. And, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking in a way to meet someone who's been at this one place their whole life. And like, that's the end of that whole lineage. Their kids are not following in their footsteps, nor would you want them to. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's interesting, I think when you're looking at the photographs of a factory that's been around for a long time, is you can kind of pull pieces out that you know have been there from like since the earlier days. Um, we were looking at um, Joe Elliott's stuff on mm -hmm. the mountaintop. And um, one of the things that was really interesting to me, because I come from a graphic design perspective, is the the um, the signage and and um, a few of the signs that were sort of warning people, like sort of like hazard signs um, that were hung around the factory, were dating back to probably like the 1920s or 1930s, mm -hmm. but still very much appropriate today. And and looking at your asylum images from you know a previous project, you could see a lot of that, and a lot of the focus is on that sort of. It's kind of like the place closes doors, people don't go in there anymore, and it just freezes in time. It, but a factory that's still very much alive is that and then some, and then it's moving into the future at the mm -hmm. same time. Um, so you have this layer of sort of activity that's happening, this layer of life, and some of it gets captured and encapsulated, and then some of it keeps moving forward, and it's just really fa fascinating. Um, one of the things that I really enjoy, and you've kind of brought this up a couple times, is like the sort of sense of wonder that's involved mm -hmm. when you when you gain access to something like this i think this is something that everybody has these ideas when you're driving by a factory or something like that that sort of willy wonka kind of thing mm -hmm. like what is going on behind the doors i mean you're really mm -hmm. able to expose that and i wonder like does that ever sort of dissipate you have expectations or you just kind of are okay with it or you ah, always yeah. is that is that like a driving part of behind the project is just kind of getting in there and, and, and sort of finding out how the world works. Yeah, I, actually, I meant that was a part I, I haven't fully memorized this lecture yet. Uh, <laughs> I made this especially for, for tonight. I tweaked things, but there's a part, the last thing I was supposed to say, like, I still, whenever I still walk in, I still feel the same sense of wonder. And I do, for the most part. Um, the problem with having been to so many places is that I know right away when I walk into a place, what it's going to feel. I don't know if I can pull it off. If I have time and access, I can make something interesting, but I usually know right away what fruit it will bear. Whereas mm -hmm. back then years ago, when I was starting out, I would go in and I, I just didn't possess the knowledge. And I was like, Oh, that's cool. Oh, look at that. Whereas now I'm just like, Nope, 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 Nope. Oh yeah, that's it. Uh, and then it's up to me to make a beautiful picture. But yeah, on my best days, you do feel the same. You know, the sweet spot is when you've been to a place, let's say you're going to be there for three days. The first day is frustrating. <laughs> Second day, you begin to hit your stride, maybe there for four days. And that third day, you're just nailing it because you know how things unfold. You know the schedule. You know you have the ideas are in your head. Mm -hmm. The game plan is there. And now you just have to execute it. Um, and that sense of like, leaving that place, extracting beauty, making a picture that no one else has ever made before, even if no one cares, mm -hmm. at least to you, it means something. And you know that it has value. There's, you know, it's like an artist Then you know, when you're in it, you want to be in it. You don't want to finish it. You want to be in it, but it's that, that's the, that's the point that you want to, that you strive for. Um, and so to that end, I, I never lose that sense of excitement. It's just now I'm, I have to get pickier and I don't know what it is about, this year but god it's like trying to get into different places it's like it's like trying to pull teeth i mean it's just mm -hmm. a lot of places just don't you know they don't want to be bothered anymore i was going to mention um from a kind of our historical perspective that um i found like a lot of um how to say like disciplines um uh perspectives within your own with within your work like there is you know you're an archaeologist like you're an architect you are um, kind of interested in materiality, of course, in humans, but also there is uh, kind of an allegorical perspective that I that I'm very interested in, especially um, in 
you know, in the images of the piano that don't really look like piano, but look like political abstraction and, you know, kind of how the line can be something beyond that kind of strict, strict line, which is how we, you know, tend to think about the line. The line can be many things. It can be knots, it can be roots, whatever. So that's one thing. And the other one, uh, the tracks, uh, when the tracks are being built, but they really look like toys. Yeah. So we're looking, you are a documentary photographer, you you go in commission, you publish at the New York Times, like what a dream job. But at the same time, uh, those images, we see something, it's kind of a document of the of the of the industrial site, but then at the same time looks something like as something totally different, right? So the allegorical dimension of the fiction that an image an image can actually portray as well. So the fact that an image is never really that that we see, yeah. that can be much more. So that kind of allegorical aspect that, you know, that more like, like aesthetic or artistic aspect in its poor kind of, you know, non-Kantian way is still, is, is still there. That's, that's the sweet spot. And that's like, I struggle with that because coming, being an architect, I tend to see things very literally. Mm -hmm. my, my write literally, I write the same sentences over and over again. <laughs> I, and I take the same boring pictures most of the time. I mean, it's horrible. I mean, even the picture they use for this poster that I sent you guys, it's just like, what is this, like a yearbook picture that I sent you? It's it's just no, I, it's so easy for me to just like, oh, here's the shot, line it up, make it all nice and perfect. But the good thing about working with editorial, like really good editors is that they're always looking for exactly what you say. Mm -hmm. They don't want to see, you know, all this, the other stuff I took at John Deere, four days worth, a lot, it's all really good. There's some really great ones, but there's one picture that makes the fact that tractors look like toys. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that the editors sort of keep, you know. So that is really getting it, abstracting, you know, taking something that's banal and making it poetic or literal and making it abstract. That's what you want. That's really what interests the editors because they're not, they don't care about tractors, mm -hmm. you know, they don't care about fuselages the way, the way I do. Balance. Or voting, well, they care about voting ballots, but they want to see the voting ballot in an abstract way. And so that has made me a better photographer, but left to my own devices, I just, it's surprising that I've gotten this far. <laughs> um, because sometimes I just, I just, you know, you just stop seeing things in a fresh way and it's mm. frightening. So you have to keep failing to move forward. Yeah. yeah. Could you touch on that just? Sorry, just, so, just, a, just a little bit more of that idea of you mentioned how hard it is to gain access and how mm. still after all these years of trying to push yourself into into different um, um, mm -hmm. manufacturing plants, getting some access, but not getting all of the access that you want. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that kind of frustration and how do you push past that to keep yourself on that creative path? I feel like mm -hmm. a lot of us who you know, want to engage in creative endeavors, we get shut down and, and we take it personally and then mm -hmm. it sets us back so much. How do you keep moving forward with that? I don't, well, you've seen me. I'm usually grumpy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, when I come visit you, I'm usually in a bad mood. <laughs> but um, it's heartbreaking. And like, you know, with the pencils, five years, I remember when the owner called me and his daughter who ran the company had pulled the plug. The old, the old guy who'd met me, he was all for me going in there. And he's like, Chris, I, I just, I, it kills me, but she doesn't want, she doesn't want to do it. We don't, she just doesn't feel comfortable. I was in tears because I knew I had something really amazing. And yet I didn't possess the technical skill at that time to really do it right. So it works out in the end. Um, I mean, I get turned down. I mean, today I got, I, I passed this week. It's just like one after another, you know, uh, can't let, we can't do it. And I remember like, but I just, I never give up um, because the people who say no move on or they retire, someone else replaces them. Maybe they come out with a new product that they want to promote and then you seize that, that opportunity. Uh, or uh, I remember when I did this Airbus feature for the New York Times, I also went to Pratt & Whitney and they make jet engines. Um, they didn't give me enough time there and that really annoyed me. I felt like a documentarian and not an artist. And so that's why I approached GE which was, a, they were a little more like, oh yeah, sure, come out. So then now, last month, I called, called Pratt & Whitney back up and I said, well, I have this, this big exhibit next year at the Cooper Hewitt. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, do you guys want to be in it? And they, and she said, well, who else is going to be in it? Well, I said, well, you know, GE, <laughs> your competitor will be in it. And she says, oh, that's good to know because the higher ups are going to really, they're going to really, you know, that'll like get them. So, you know, you just got to keep a, a list, but there are certain places that, um, uh, you know, or they just don't get back to you and they don't give you reason. And that's like the worst because then you don't, it's like, what did I do wrong? You know, it's like a relationship that goes bad and they break up with you and you're like, what, why, what, what happened? You know, I didn't, what did I do? And, but they never, they're not obligated to tell you anything. And so fortunately there are things, you know, that many companies make many of the same thing. And so if one place doesn't work, you go to their competitor, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's heartbreaking. I just have to keep putting myself, you know, you got to put one foot in front of the other and you got to understand that like um, most people give up. Mm -hmm. I have assistants who are super, super talented, far better artists than me, technicians. And they talk to me about stuff they want to do, but they never do it. And you just have to keep like, know that you're going to fail most of the time, but you have to, you have to make the work or else there's nothing really to talk about. And so, you know, if I get turned down, then I, next day I'm going to email someone else and put that on the back burner and know that at some point things come full circle. Yeah. Thank you. So we probably have time for one or two questions from the audience. Sorry about kind of that uh, shrunk uh, possibilities for us to all have a dialogue. Do you, if you have a question, then you can raise your hand and have Jen approach you or Eric. Can you raise your hand if you have a question and we'll So my question would be about color. So in looking through some of those images, um, color plays such a prominent uh, place in the tone. I don't know if that was, um, uh, you, you mentioned the yarn, the, the pink one, you had shot it in orange, you came back because you had to have it in pink. So could you speak a little bit about the importance of color and what you're trying to do from a creative? Yeah, color's everything. Especially editors love color. Uh, most of those mills that I went to would be running gray or white or black most of the time. And you go in there and it's just like, ah, and they'll say, oh, you should have been here last week. We were running blah, blah, blah. So uh, color is always, you know, a great way to turn a drab environment into something magical. Do you have a, is it a, do you have, do you need to have a sort of background in color theory and understanding how colors are working? Or is it more an instinctual thing that you walk in and go, wow, it's yellow. You know what I mean? Like, is it it's, it's usually that. Yeah. And I know enough at this point to, um, if let's say, you know, there's a sea of something or different colors and I want to bring in a person, I usually will try to, uh, if let's say I know I'm going to photograph them the next day, I'll say, wear either wear what you're wearing now, don't wash it, wear it tomorrow or bring in several things and let's, see what contrasts the best. Um, so I love to find seas of color and then insert, or seas of just gray and then insert like one person that has, but you know, whenever they show up and they're like, we're in all black or gray, or it's just like, oh God. Um, and sometimes I they'll borrow a shirt from someone else or, you know, um, but yeah, I'll go to any lengths to, to get some color into, into a picture. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I, cool. I love factory tours. And I was curious if there's any place that that you've been that offers tours of the public for the public that you would recommend. I think I think Martin does. Martin does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Peeps place take off. No, I mean honestly, Peeps is not, you know, it's not, it's just assembly line things in vats, what's in there. And then all of a sudden these little things get squirted out. It's not really, the Martin is just like, that's just totally awesome because there's so many discrete steps that are unique and specific to making a guitar. Um, I don't think Steinway does that. Steinway is just like, I mean, for someone who loves music, that'll, that'll bring tears to your eyes. I mean, it smells like, Martin is a modern factory using traditional methods, but you go to Steinway and it's like, like you smell a hundred plus, you know, the night since the 19th century, you smell it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, you know, I don't, I, I do look occasionally online for places that give tours, but um, 
Yeah, it's hard to know. And usually they're not gonna give you the kind of access that you really want. Um, if you can convince someone to give you like a really behind the scenes tour, that's that's kind of what you want. Yeah, but it's worth, you know, just email a lot of these places. I don't know, but I wish I could be more help. I'm sorry. Yeah. Let's go with one more question if anybody has one. Yeah. Oh, somebody has two questions. I think I did question. Sorry. I have two. Okay. Uh, hello. I just want to say thank you so much. This was uh, it was pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. um, my question is not as photography related. It's more so what you said last about the pencil factory and how the old guy wanted to do it and his daughter wanted to close the doors. Um, do you know why that is? Was it not profitable enough? Did they get bought out? Did it, or did it just went away? Oh no, close the door on my project. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I was like, oh, we're gonna do this, the last pencil factory and that's gonna be the title. And she's like, no, 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 no. We don't want people to think that we're dying, that we're a dinosaur. Uh, but then, you know, they see your other work eventually and they're like, wait a minute. This is good for business. So, um, yeah, no, it wasn't. It, it wasn't that. Um, but you know, some places you do sense that something's a little off. But other times, I've been to a factory and it's like seems to be going great. Um, and then you read a few years later that they were bought out, private equity, and they weren't deemed profitable enough, yeah. and they shut them down. I went to there's a famous. Uh, if there was like one place I could go back to, it would be, it was called the Cone Denim Mill. And they are basically the original denim factory in North Carolina. And I saw it when it was still running. And it was just mind boggling because they made denim from start to finish. And they made denim for all the, you know, big brands that they would ship this denim overseas and whatnot. And the, the looms were like ancient. And I didn't possess the skill set to do it right. But so I showed up there with my four by five and the marketing woman is like, what are you doing? Like, why is this? Are you kidding me? And she actually cut my visit short by a day. She's like, all right, we got to wrap up by noon today. I was like, in, I was almost in tears. And then a few years later, the company was bought by private equity and they, they shut it down. The most historic mill in the country. And it wasn't profitable enough. And so that opportunity is gone. So yeah. And that, that's kind of what I was thinking you were talking about a little bit there, but that things getting bought out and then private equity is like, oh, our shareholders want it to be uh, 10%, not 7%. So yeah. And it's, and it affects and then it kills the community. Um, and all that knowledge is lost. Uh, one, one of the really sad things, it's like, you accept that there are things come and go. But one of the sad things is like, um, I went to the New Balance is one of the only major shoe manufacturer that still has a presence in this country. And they actually still make shoes at a big scale at, they have five factories in, in the Northeast. So I went to one last month in Fall River on um, uh, Lawrence, which used to be an insanely large. I mean, the mills there are just like, you can't believe how big they are. What was admirable is that they're still making shoes there, high end, you know, kind of running shoes, um, more like, you know, recreational. Uh, but profitable and you walk in there and it's thriving and it's in an old mill building that they've saved. But the sad thing is, is that not one of those machines that's used to make the shoes is made in America. And if you go to like, when I went to the football factory, that essentially is a shoe factory. And they're using a lot of equipment that was used to make shoes. And every machine in there was made in New England or Massachusetts. Every single company that makes things that makes the machines that make the stuff that we use is now overseas. So any of the shoe or apparel industries, all those companies are gone. And so with that, you, you lose the knowledge, the know-how and the sense of innovation. It's not enough to be able to design something and put it on your, on your box and say, designed in USA, you know, engineered and designed in USA. That means nothing. That means that the real innovation and the technology is happening somewhere else. And that we've lost that. And so, you know, that's the depressing part is when I go into a factory and I'm looking at machines that are just, you know, are made somewhere else and that there's, and that the people there are just kind of operating them, but don't know them intimately the way they would have used to know them. Mm -hmm. 
Nick, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, um, I'm I'm an architect, so I'm 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 kind of used to look look at, to looking at photography that's devoid of humans. Um, and uh, over the years, of course, you see the passions of the different styles of photography. And like when you start, a lot of your photography seems to be borrowing these kind of that also rapid projection, um, <clears throat> single point perspectives. Yeah. Things like that. And not to be a downer, but that there's definitely like the, the the nostalgia and even all the comments that are associated here deal with uh, um, are inherently political. Um, and we may kind of think that they are of the time. Um, but uh, I, I kept thinking like, what would that image, even though it's relatively current, look like in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 30s or 20s? And, like, and I'm thinking that perhaps the, the, the theme, the approach, the interest is not that novel. I mean, this is a, um, uh, a, a way to seek, to, to classify or organize um, means of uh, mass production. Um, and I'm reminded of a lot of, uh, you know, like uh, mid-century, 30s, 20s, uh, German photography. Walter Benjamin wrote uh, the, what is it, the work of art of mechanical reproduction, how it's devoid of authenticity. Right, the aura is taken away, and the only way to access work of art like this is through um, political praxis, right? Like you look through a political lens, mm. and that makes it revolutionary, right? Um, so, like, I'm really curious about. Like, I mean, there's timelessness. There's on that axis, uh, you can position that these these photographs, um, not necessarily in 2024. It could be. 2014, right? Yeah. Um, and um, and I'm just wondering, like, you know, something that stood out. Like, I'm really curious about it. Like, um, uh, you know, the actor and the set, the relationship between the machine and the color, the machine and the person, the worker, the story of the worker, which is which is what makes it political. Mm -hmm. And somehow you wove in uh, a, a few comments about, well, the thing is beautiful, but it's not. No, it's photogenic, but it's not beautiful. Can you elaborate on the difference between beautiful images and photogenic images? I think that, to me, those two words are sort of the same. Uh, yeah, for, for me, it, my interest as an as a ex-architect is, is I, I'm just fascinated by how things work and how they're made. And so I'm always trying trying to get at that. Uh, and so a lot of pictures that I do make are not novel or interesting to most people. I find them interesting because they're documenting, they're showing how something's made, but they're not necessarily photogenic. And so, so what what the editors tell me at least, and what I've, I get a good sense of now is, is that photogenic is that balance that, that lifts that photograph out of its literal context where you don't have to know or care what you're looking at and it becomes something else and that, you know, inspires one's imagination and interest in what they're looking at. Maybe, you know, what what is he trying to say here? A sense of mystery. It's like, you know, the less you say, the more questions you ask about that. But if I'm being literal in some of these pictures, then everything is solved there for the viewer and there's nothing left to uh, the imagination. But so photogenic and beauty to me are kind of kind of interchangeable because beauty is very photogenic, but I think photo, uh, beauty beauty is very subjective is what I mean. But uh, photogenic is just something that lays itself out in a pleasing way for the camera, whether it's the lighting or the color or the composition, where everything just kind of looks natural. Um, and uh, But it's not necessarily so interesting. What I think when I walk into a place, I say, that's cool. Look at that. That's cool. That's cool. Interesting, but not photogenic. Um, and that's just sort of a self something I've had to teach myself over the years and I usually fail. I fail less and less now. Yeah. Diana, you had a question, I think. No, no? Okay. So thanks so much. Uh, you can you can see the photos in uh, the EWFM FML library till middle of January. So if you haven't had a chance and you want to kind of be more familiar and have a really good experience of what we saw on the screen today, Please go there.
because they're really awesome. Thank you so much Thank for you. this. Thank you. It's great. Thank you, Kevin. To the two of you, because you were doing it together. Thanks, and man. thanks, everybody, for coming here today and staying with us. Okay. See ya. Thank you. Good stuff. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff.